I'm going to call the fiscal committee meeting to order. Uh, first of all, item number two, we need proof. So move, move approval, Aguilar. Second, Karski. It's been moved and second to approve the minutes. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Those are approved. Item number three, reports and updates. First, item A, discussion regarding city sales tax collection at WH Lion Fairgrounds. Jeffrey Schmidt from planning. Thank you for having us back again. Um, we were here last month to talk about coming through with an agreement or a memorandum of understanding in regards to the sales tax issue. Uh, we're still on that same intent. I think we're going to be able to meet that. What um, Minnehaha County Commissioner Dick Kelly wanted to do was to make sure that we were still talking about it. We didn't have to come up with a determination last month or this month, but move forward in some direction. What staff has done along with the Sioux Empire Fair Board is continue to list and then tabulate what these projects are. Currently we have 10 projects listed. Tabulating them, putting a cost behind them, they're running between $1,000 and $5,000 per task or item. And so we're in that maybe twenty-five dollars to $50,000 range um, on what these back and forth costs are. Again, in what our end uh, task is, what we're trying to do here is the city's putting forward capital because um, we have the capital equipment, then therefore the, the county doesn't have to put up the capital to do some of the improvements. And the city needs land, and the fair has land. So we want to be able to kind of balance those things. We do the capital, they have the land, and in the end, um, we have a nice cooperative agreement. Again, at this point, it's been drafted. It's been through the attorney's office, this memorandum of, of understanding, but we don't have the dollar values all set behind them. But that's the direction we're proceeding. So. Um, as again, as um, Councilmember Brown mentioned, we do have a representative from the county here today, Robert Wilson. We talked already beforehand, and again, they're just continuing to track with us to make sure that we're getting this project done. Any questions for Jeffrey Schmidt? So, Jeff, should we just leave it on the agenda for next month, too, and, and see where we're at then? Yeah, we did make a good um, step forward this time in getting all the projects listed in Minnehaha, or the, the Fair Board has given me their dollar values. We just have to reciprocate. So. By next month, we should have a nice draft for you to review. We will see you next month. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Robert, did you have anything to add or anything you wanted to address? Okay. Very good. Thank you. We'll move on to item 3B, discussion regarding fraud policy. Uh, internal audit, Rich Oxel. Good afternoon, committee. Um, this is just uh, a little discussion. We don't have anything to present to you on this date. Um, back in, uh, I believe, June of this year, we had the discussion with the uh, with the internal or the audit committee, or at least I did, about uh, the necessity of having a fraud policy for the city, and uh, it was directed to uh, start researching that and then uh, proceed forward with that and present that to the uh, to the fiscal committee. And um, I have had a conversation with with uh, Director of HR Bill O'Toole and with the City Attorney uh, Dave Fifley, and I'd come up with a, a first draft of a fraud policy based on uh, best practices, and um, we had a little discussion of that. And uh, but before we wanted to to get any further, we wanted some. Uh, uh, some clarity, perhaps from council members, about uh, how we we would uh, you know set this up, whether it be ordinance or, or how we would do this. But uh, I'll just give you a, a brief background on on importance a fraud policy. Um, a fraud policy basically sets the tone at the top. It, it's it's telling the employees and management uh, what our expectations are of of uh, employees if they were to notice fraud, what they should do, how they should report it. Uh, it defines fraud, um, maybe not every single uh, thing you can think of, but, but there's enough detail there that, that a person who reads it as an employee could understand these are things I, not, I should not be doing, this is who I should report it to, and it also uh, sets a policy of, uh, that we would seek uh, prosecution and restitution in any cases of, of, of uh, financial improprieties. 
And it uh, also sets up the uh, responsibilities, like who does what, who's supposed to investigate, who, who gets reported to, uh, who does the follow-up, and it, the policy would set that all out in writing. Um, so the question that came up, especially from the city attorney, is, is you know, how, how do we, how does the council want this to proceed? Once we come up with a, we've, we've you know, edited the policy and we've got something to present to you. Um, do you see that as, as an ordinance that, that would be adopted uh, rather than an executive order from the mayor? Um, so I guess we just need a little feedback from the, uh, from the committee or council members that want to talk about that, uh, how they see that going down. So, Rich, I would just ask uh, what are best practices in other cities? Well, typically uh, you'll see it several different ways. It depends on the form of government. With, if you have a city manager, um, a lot of times it'll just be a directive from the city manager, but that's a different form of government. Um, the, uh, in our, our case, we have the, the two branches. We have the executive and basically the legislative. Um, but the, the city council sets policy, and I would say that this is a policy um, and that I would want it uh, probably under ordinance maybe rather than a resolution. Um, I don't think an executive order would be appropriate. I think it would be more important to have this come from the council. So I guess uh, my recommendation would be doing it as some sort of form of ordinance. But, uh, Councilor Karski. When I think of a fraud policy, I, I guess I think of a, an employee handbook and maybe stuff involving harassment, discrimination, that type of thing. How are those addressed currently? Well, I, I think those are normally a, a policy that uh, oftentimes HR and the city attorney will draft and they'll be uh, just part of, uh, you know, policy for city employees. And I don't think that would normally go through the city council. I, I don't recall that it has. Um, however, I'm not, uh, I haven't researched that, but um, yes, we do have uh, policies on that, on those sort of issues. Councilor Aguilar. I believe oh. that some of those are under um, executive order. Okay. I was just wondering, would this be any different than, than that? Would, and would, even would the city attorney, just um, not to re recommend it necessarily, saying, well, perhaps, you know, do we have a, uh, an ordinance and then just have a parallel executive order? Um, it, would that be the way to do it? Um, uh, I don't know what the appropriate way to do it is. Any other thoughts? Councilor Jamison. I would just add from the, uh, from the audit committee's perspective, our biggest objective was to find direction for uh, the auditors who are the ones who receive these fraud hotline tips. They need to have a well spelled out procedure for them to follow. Um, you know, I know you have it listed here as a fraud policy. It's probably more definable as a fraud investigation policy. Is that fair to say? Well. Um Certainly, when you when you have a fraud policy, you're you're going to have enough detail that you understand how how um, uh, a call to the fraud hotline would be handled. Uh, typically, how, you know how that would be handled, who would investigate, how that would be reported, um, and uh, and uh, certainly that that's a that's a major part of it. But I think there's also that part of a fraud policy, a good one that would define fraud. It's, it's an education tool for your employees when they first become an employee of the city, this information we present it to them. Um, you'd probably have it posted on, on Insight, the intranet. Um, uh, you might every once in a great while do some training on uh, ethics or fraud for your current employees. So it's an educational tool for your employees besides being a uh, procedure uh, for your auditors to follow too. But I, If I could just follow up, I think an executive order is only applies to the uh, city employees. That's, and, uh, that's think, correct, yeah. I think what could easily happen is that a, a contractor working for the city could be involved in something. And, and I, I think we need a further reaching tool like an ordinance to yeah. really have the teeth to have all the necessary elements uh, to enforce it and to in, in investigate and to outline uh, procedures. So. I mean, that's what I would add is just an ordinance is probably the answer. Councilor Aguilar. Would the ordinance then apply to staff also? Or would we, as, as maybe was suggested, have to do both an executive order and an ordinance? What are you thinking, Rich? Well, that, that was just sort of that, something that the uh, city attorney had, had just thought about, um, um, you know, maybe the, 
that would be a way to do it, uh, to have, a, have an executive order that parallels the fraud policy, which is adopted by ordinance. But um, I don't think we've ever done that before, as far as I know. Uh, so that's kind of it's kind of new territory. But. I think all the employees would still be uh, would still fall under a regular ordinance of any yeah. any city ordinance. So I would say probably 99% of the employees fall under the, under the executive orders. It would be just um, people in my position or city clerks that would not right. fall under executive orders. Would the committee like um, Rich to bring a draft ordinance then by next meeting? Yes. Sue? Um, Rich, will you be bringing something to audit? I think we have a meeting on the 22nd. I could give you, certainly give you an update and I could, I could show you the first draft, but when I talked to uh, Bill O'Toole and uh, the city attorney, they, they had a number of things. Oh, we probably need to change this or have we thought about this? So it would definitely be a rough draft. But uh, certainly the audit committee could see that in, in when they meet in about uh, two weeks or so. Well, and maybe get some input yeah. from them and then bring for next month the... Yeah. Some more information perhaps. Right. Yeah. This yeah. may be several month process before That'd we be get good. this. And finalized. if we could get something to, to review before our meeting so we can be able to react and give you some yeah. direction when we're at this meeting, that'd be helpful. Okay. So I will... Um, put that on the agenda for audit committee and then we'll um, yeah, have further discussion on this. So. Any other questions or comments for Rich? I do have one. I'm just curious. What, what are we seeing in numbers of calls to the fraud hotline, if you know? Um, in the past, we've had maybe one or two calls a year. Now we're up to maybe three or four calls a year. It's not, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of calls. We, we've seen more, and I think part of that is we're, we're just uh, advertising it more, so to speak. We've mm -hmm. put it on the employee uh, bulletin boards, and uh, we've sent uh, uh, things out um, by other channels to make employees aware of it. Um, and I'd like to think it's because we don't have anything to report. That's you never you're never sure. So, which is, when you consider we have over a thousand employees, only three to four calls a year, that that is probably a good indicator. Yeah. Uh, remind us what the process is. That goes to is it Ide Bailey or some no? Uh, we have a contract with a provider called the Network, which is a one of the largest uh, providers of the service in the, in the United States, and. It's a company based in Georgia, so when the employee would call the number, it's a toll-free number, um, a person in Georgia would answer the, uh, answer the phone and take the information, uh, prepare a report, and email that report to me. I would never hear the call. They don't record the calls. They just prepare an email report, and then they send it uh, to my email account. So that's how it gets reported. Very good. Greg? Uh, I just wanted to kind of express a little bit of a uh, uh, understanding of the the poli or the procedures and the problems we've encountered uh, in business. It would be pretty easy if somebody if you figure somebody's stealing from you, you know, you can go and do some things. But in the public sector, there's just so many other little things that really gets complicated because uh, there's a lot of privacies, privacy issues. There's a lot of other HR concerns. It's complicated. It, yeah, it's it gets really, complicated. There's, really, there's union contracts. Or there's more issues in government, perhaps, in investigating and dealing with issues. But uh, certainly, uh, it, it's certainly best practice. And, and it, it was our, from our very first audit report that we'd recommend having the fraud hotline. And we'd also recommend it having a, a fraud policy back at that point. And so we're kind of getting that recommendation implemented. So, Thanks for your diligence. All right, I think that's it for now. Thank you, Rich. We appreciate okay. you being here. Are there other items to discuss? If not, this will be a short meeting. We are adjourned. <laughs>